Welcome back to the Postland session on shipbuilding and ship repair, where we have professionals from three leading companies, Cochin Shipyard, Konkan Maritime Cluster, and l and Shipbuilding Limited, represented by Mr. G. Shivram, GM of Cochin Shipyard, Mr. Suraj Dailani from CEO uh, CMD Konkan Maritime Cluster, and Mr. Rishikesh Narsiman, GM l &T. Mr. Sabiyasachi Hazra, Inmex SMM India Advisory Chair, will be the convener for this session. I invite Mr. G. Shivram N, Business Development GM for Cochin Shipyard for this presentation. Mr. Shivram, with more than 30 years of professional marine experience, has earlier worked as Marine Chief Engineer, Classification Marine Surveyor, and Ship Operations Manager, and he is for the past 15 years with Cochin Shipyard. Over to you, Mr. Shivra. Yeah, thank you, Padma, and uh, thanks, uh, Inmax, for giving this uh, platform to express my, myself. Am I audible? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, yes, you are perfectly audible, Mr. Shivra. Please continue. Yeah, thank you. So, shall I share the screen to get my PPT? Yes. Yeah. Is my screen uh, visible, sir? Yes, it is visible. Yeah. So thank you. Um, so with respect to the subject matter, what we have, be, we are uh, here with uh, presenting with shipbuilding and ship repair. I'll just try to touch upon a uh, few points whereby uh, India can showcase itself and win uh, global orders as we move forward. Just to give a brief background uh, on uh, where, how we have performed in the recent past or in this uh, last two decades, India has demonstrated shipbuilding ability quite uh, well in the early 2000s when uh, we were uh, building almost uh, three, 300,000 plus GT per annum. And uh, at that point of time, uh, Especially in the offshore industry, Indian uh, shipyards were uh, holding more than 30% of the world order book. So early 2000, up to 2008-9, we have performed relatively well. And uh, we were also investing, many of the shipyards were uh, doing well, flourishing well. They were investing in infrastructure and the capacity was also being built. But right now, yes, we are struggling. The last uh, two years, uh, our uh, output is uh, 30,000 GT, something like that. And it's uh, really something which needs a lot of improvement. And uh, if you look at the competition, yes, there is a strong global competition when it comes to the commercial shipbuilding in all spheres. And uh, if you look at uh, various uh, major uh, ship shipbuilding nations like China, Japan, or Korea, there are a lot of regulatory support which was given to them in the initial phase of their uh, infrastructure building. Later on, uh, they became uh, self-sufficient and the, the efficiencies and the infrastructure improved to the extent that the world market started uh, using these uh, nations. And uh, based on the studies, what we have, India got a cost disadvantage of 20 to 22% with respect to the cost factors on various uh, major nations. Three factors are uh, driving high costs in India. One is the material costs because uh, localization is very poor and we are dependent on uh, uh, almost all major equipments which are being imported. Low labor productivity that again offsets, even though we think uh, labor uh, wages are less in India, when, it, when you multi compound it with uh, productivity, 
our labor costs are not that cheap and uh, high finance costs this again is a major factor when it comes to new ship building where long gestation periods are there for the ship ship building so if you look at the capacity yes india got lot of uh, shipyards in on east and west coast there are about 20 22 shipyards which are uh, reasonably running maybe with lot of difficulties and there are uh, there is a equal amount of shipyards which uh, are not uh, functional as well especially bharati abg and uh, reliance uh, going away india's uh, uh, infrastructure and the capacity has uh, come down very much the last two years uh, cochin has revived uh, two shipyards one is uh, tepman shipyard in the west coast near mangalore and uh, cochin also has uh, taken over uh, hugli docks and engineers uh, private limited so three facilities all together has been revived uh, by uh, cochin and uh, some of the other yards which are available for revival uh, we have to wait because the building process they are in various stages of recovery now coming to the how the ship building can come back to the old glory or it can even it can go further forward so there are three focus areas to initi initiate a vicious circle cycle which can trigger the vibrance to the industry one is the demand activation if you look at the overall world market now the demand has improved the shipping is doing well the charter rates are good ship owners are making money nowadays there is definitely there is a positivity in the overall uh, shipping that definitely will reflect in the ship building also the last year order book of 2021 has improved and uh, the prices are also has been much better than what it was before so the shipyards are looking comfortable in the uh, major nations like uh, china korea or uh, japan so definitely that demand activation has slowly started in the other parts of the world sorry for but, interruption mr shivaram but your uh, presentation is right on the first slide itself it has not moved at all oh i see then uh, uh, i did it change now no it has not changed it's just on that first slide jai hind oh i see uh, <laughs> oh should i should i tell the organizers can to... i can i put it on the can you put it on the slide show down below just press the slide show and keep actually in my screen uh, now it... now yes yeah now now it has moved it moved you need to go up uh, yeah, yeah 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 now it is moving okay so am i on the various uh, shipyards list of shipyards india no it is this is a uh, you are on india has sufficient installed capacity oh, that's what various shipyards that's what i was yeah, talking about that's right that's right that's right yeah, that's okay right. so i'll just i i i'm in this uh, three focus areas to initiate uh, the right. demand right it's there yeah so so the demand activation is uh, one major uh, thing which needs to happen in india number two is the ecosystem development because uh, as the infrastructure of various uh, shipyards has gone down and uh, many shipyards become def defunct to make a threshold uh, in the overall uh, critical mass the ecosystem needs uh, rejuvenation which has run down in the last uh, decade or so and third is the fiscal support which uh, definitely is something which happens in this industry across the globe to have a sustainable uh, development in ship building especially so global benchmarks indicate four key principles to drive the breakthrough of the sec sector one is end to end localization that means the domestic cargo domestic ships and the domestic yards so this is the way all the ship building nations have uh, built up their infrastructure so shipping has to do well 
ship owners and ship operators in India has to do well, and that needs to percolate to the shipyards as well. Then gradual disincentivization of old and imported ships. This is something very important to bring the demand. So uh, the nation should not become a uh, junk uh, ship uh, importing yard, uh, country. We need to have some uh, uh, limitation to the older uh, tonnage which can be imported. So the Indian cargo has to move on uh, quality ships and uh, there should be some uh, gradual the incentivization whenever we are importing to bring parity between uh, new building and uh, older uh, imported uh, tonnages. Then priority cargo for domestic vessels this is very important. Our uh, ship owners should get cargo, they should get charter, they should get uh, paid. Then only they will be interested in uh, increasing the tonnage. That only can uh, increase the demand. And the physical incentivization for ship owning, ship building and repairing. This is something very important. Ship owners also needs to have uh, sufficient uh, financing support, which should come to them for uh, adding new tonnages. Similarly, the shipyards as well, whenever they are uh, getting for any project execution funds. So there was a maritime fund which was being which is being uh, spoken by, widely for the last five years. Nothing has happened. I think this is something which is very important for activation of the shipbuilding in the country. Now, how uh, we can uh, trigger this demand and uh, leverage our infrastructure? So I'll just give you a few examples uh, what are available in the market, which is now uh, widely visible. New urban transportation models are being developed in various uh, small places. For example, in Cochin, Cochin Water Metro has come out with a seamless transportation integrated uh, solution for their urban uh, transportation, whereby they are uh, planning to build 78 electric boats for the urban transportation, which are which will seamlessly connect the rail, water, and road. So the first phase is on, and uh, electric boats are being built, and uh, Cochin is uh, doing, executing this project. So this is, uh, so similar uh, concepts are being developed. Uh, Bombay is talking about uh, similar uh, concepts, there are various other opportunities which are coming up in this uh, water transportation segment. The, the What you see in the picture is Bergen. Uh, maybe Mumbai will look like this in next uh, 10 years or so, because uh, already water taxis are being introduced between Awashi uh, and uh, New Bom uh, from New Bombay to South Mumbai. And uh, similar uh, solutions are being sought, which are becoming essential. Similarly, when you talk about uh, national waterways, yes, there are a lot of investments which has gone. There is further uh, economic growth being uh, projected uh, across uh, NW1 and 2. India's 40% uh, of Indian uh, population uh, resides uh, on the banks of these uh, uh, thickly populated uh, populous states of Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Assam, West Bengal, etc. So definitely this is bringing more opportunity for uh, uh, maritime uh, uh, industry as well. So let it be. So all these investments are going to trigger uh, interest, and they are going to improve the demand. So Indian domestic demand has to be leveraged, and uh, this is something which can immediately activate the shipyards in India when we are talking about the commercial ships. So we can. Uh, be competitive and we can address about uh, uh, one study shows uh, about uh, 11,000 crores of GDP addition can happen through these uh, uh, domestic uh, demand in the maritime sector. And uh, this can be coastal, offshore, port crafts, dredgers, tugs, and inland uh, crafts of all types, which are necessary for such uh, activation. Already we could see some uh, positive uh, 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 moves in this happening. Many investments are done. Many tonnage additions are happening. So these are all some of the vessels which are addressing these segments which are being built or already delivered uh, from Cochin itself and similar uh, activities uh, can be seen in various other shipyards also. So the domestic demand for these uh, smaller vessel portfolio is a rising segment which uh, all uh, shipbuilders can work on and that can build the 
minimum uh, infrastructure and competency before they go to the bigger platforms. So this I spoke about. And the coastal vessel, for example, uh, mini bulk carriers, they are being uh, mini more small cement carriers. And new generation vessels are also being necessary for various requirement. So what uh, we can, once we establish these efficiencies in our uh, system, then uh, with the timely delivery, competitive pricing and quality, which uh, India has already demonstrated, India can make for the world through Make in India, which uh, our Prime Minister always uh, calls for. And uh, just to give an example, Make for the World, I would like to probably talk about one project which Cochin itself is doing. In Cochin Shipyard, we are building an autonomous, fully electric vessel, two vessels in fact, for a Norwegian customer. And uh, it's a pure electric uh, vessel and it will also work as an autonomous vessel once the phase two trials are completed in uh, Norway. So these two vessels will be delivered uh, in the by April 2022 and uh, they will be world's first pure electric autonomous Aurora vessels in the then that's a very that's exactly what uh, Prime Minister was talking about making for the world through Make in India. Of course, the technology has come from uh, Norway only from Pondsberg. So we are not uh, developing those technology, but at least uh, we are a part of that integration, which is a proud thing for Indian shipbuilding industry. Now coming to ship repair, I will just touch upon a few slides. Ship repair again is a 4,000 crore uh, potential uh, uh, business. And uh, India has the capability to do this. We have got a very strong uh, labor force. We have got skill force. If you go to Singapore or Dubai, all the ship preparers got all Indian uh, engineers and the crew who do the most of the job. Even in Colombo, when you go, you will find all the welders from India. So that so skill set is not the issue. It is only that uh, environment and the ecosystem which needs uh, some slight trigger. So, and uh, we should also look at uh, ship repair to be transformed as a MRO, the way aviation industry has adopted and India is doing fairly well in that uh, segment. And we also talked about in repair, there is another uh, huge potential uh, which India can uh, look at it. We have got a strong fleet of uh, international uh, navies across the Indian Ocean. U.S. 7th Fleet and 5th Fleet are uh, uh, positioned in uh, Indian Ocean region. And uh, two years back, in fact, the Reliance uh, Defense got the approval also for U.S. Uh, Navy to do their uh, repairs. Unfortunately, the shipyard uh, had trouble and uh, they could not uh, 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 come up uh, with the performance. But otherwise, uh, logistically, India is in a very good position to address uh, this market as well. So what I would like to submit to this uh, audience is first we have to churn this uh, cycle which uh, is a bit uh, stagnant or which is not uh, really in the best of its health. Because of this downturn after this uh, 2008 uh, uh, and the collapse of the offshore industry where Indian uh, shipbuilders were over dependent. Indian uh, shipyards are struggling. So this is the time for creating the demand which can uh, improve the ecosystem, infrastructure and efficiency. So that cycle, the starting of that cycle is very important, which needs uh, some uh, government interventions which are being taken up and also the yards, uh, some quality management uh, entrance because with the shipping doing well, I believe, uh, there will be some interest from uh, good uh, quality uh, companies also to invest in this segment, which can uh, bring good quality management to the shipyards and that can uh, start this cycle. And with this, uh, once we start uh, turning this cycle, then India will become efficient with respect to the time, quality and uh, performance. Then we can make for the world as we make for India. And uh, in addition to this, as a uh, shipyard, 
for india we always are good in uh, something which is a uh, little more uh, engineering intense which is uh, more uh, customized rather than uh, round the uh, uh, only steel intense platforms so we should also look at uh, alternate fuels and decarbonization which is a major uh, uh, significant uh, uh, talking point which the world is looking forward which uh, all the ship ship designers and uh, ship builders should uh, concentrate on then digitalization is another area which is uh, 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 taking a lot of uh, importance and that is the way any operation is going to be uh, uh, taken forward so we should look at that as well and uh, new technologies like autonomous technology and uh, similar things which are also something which is going to drive the industry as we move forward so if we can uh, create that demand then uh, shipyards can uh, improve their uh, efficiencies based on the demand and perform and can step up their capability to uh, get uh, international orders which definitely will come and can also invest in uh, new trends which are required for the uh, industry shipping industry at large then uh, i am very sure that in the miv 2030 documentation what the government has released from our present uh, capacity we are supposed to migrate we have by 2030 we should at least achieve 500000 grt of uh, ship building i am very sure that uh, india can uh, progress to that uh, capability without uh, uh, much uh, difficulty so with this uh, i thank uh, and uh, just to give a small summary of what uh, cochin is doing we are uh, investing now even though the industry, industry was not doing well for the last uh, uh, decade we are investing about 3000 crores in various infrastructure in india's east coast and west coast cochin which was a single uh, unit in cochin now got seven units in bombay repair in malpe tebma shipyards in cochin one more unit and in uh, calcutta we have uh, taken over this hugli docks and engineers and we have also are running the nedaji subhash docks for repairs and in port blair uh, the dockyard for uh, mainly for repair so we are bullish on this segment and we hope uh, indian uh, india as a country can uh, come up in this uh, uh, segment which is very important which is a employment uh, generator and it's a mother of industry what we call to bring that uh, impetus and uh, serve the nation at large jai hind thank you thank you very much mr shivram uh, mr hazra would you like to make any comments uh, i thought that i would be summing up towards the yes. end i can and in any case after the all the three presentation of course one will be through video Fine. only yes uh, we will have a short i i'm sure we'll have a short question answer session and then yes. then only i'll give my comments okay so please please uh, invite the next speaker okay yeah the next presentation will be by mr suraj dailani cmd konkan maritime cluster and director vijay marine shipyard Uh, Mr. Dailani is a bachelor's degree in uh, marine uh, mechanical engineering and successfully completed his naval architecture course. He has industry experience of 16 years and believes in empowerment of MSMEs is the only way to sustainable growth of Indian economy. Over to Mr. Dailani. A very good afternoon to everybody at the India Maritime Virtual Conference. Introducing myself, Suraj Jairam Das Dailani. president for shipyard association of goa chairman and managing director for konkan maritime cluster and director for vijay marine services private limited it is an honor to be speaking at the session of ship building and repair and sharing the session with seniors and stalwarts like maduna sir and commander khetan good afternoon to both of you sir i will be speaking on how the msc shipyards can contribute to nation building through ship building and how konkan maritime cluster is participating in this role
nation building through ship building is the narrative that we are wanting to promote to the government of india and we will try to showcase through our presentation how the small shipyards of india can contribute to this cause Kunkan Maritime Cluster Goa is India's first maritime cluster under the MSC CDP scheme. MSC stands for Micro Small Enterprise. CDP stands for Cluster Development Program. Kunkan Maritime Cluster is a special purpose vehicle that has been established under the scheme. The role of Kunkan Maritime Cluster is to set up a common facility center which will help in enhancing the capacity utilization, capacity building, and productivity of the existing enterprises in Goa and the neighboring states. Goa has been part of the maritime sector of India since 1949. We have been handling bulk cargo and doing light range operations, designing ships in all kinds of materials, steel, aluminum and fiber and composite products. Building and repairs ecosystem has developed because of the export market and the light range operations that have been going on since 1949. Goa being a tourism state has also developed its own avenue in nautical tourism of uh, adventure water sports and river and sea cruising. Fishing has been an activity on which the coastal villages have been dependent for the staple diet. Having the maritime in our heart, Goans are one of the largest part of the seafarer community globally. We have certain universities and colleges also set up in Goa that impart training to seafarers. Kongan Madam Cluster, our motto is unify to empower. We have come together to empower each other and provide the necessary impetus for the shipbuilding industry. Kongan Madam Cluster is incorporated as a Section 8 company more than 50 Goan enterprises are part of this as on today and more than 150 beneficiary companies will benefit when this common facility center will be set up. Presently, the permissions and the grant for the common facility center has been availed from the central government and the state government. Land has been allotted by the state government. All the permissions for construction also have been availed and the work on factory is in progress. The existing cluster strength is what we we'll showcase in the next few slides and why we always say that Goa is a maritime expert because right from ship designing, the ship building, ship operations, owning ships, coastal and inland operations has been done by the stalwarts based in Goa. Goa also has been playing a major role in exporting ships to Europe and the Asia Pacific region. All the pictures of all the shipyards taken in Goa. We have dry docks and slippers to cater to different sizes and types of vessels. A lot of flagship projects have been built in Goa from passenger vessels and oil tankers to dredgers and crane barges for light ridge operations, to high deadweight cargo barges, 5000 tonners, to high bullet pull tugs for port operations, to mini bulk carriers, sub offshore sea construction vessels, exporting to Europe, bulk carriers, building aluminum boats, sailing boats, and FRP and composite. The entire expertise and competency is existing in Goa. That is why Goa can be named as a shipbuilding hub, catering to the entire material that is required in shipbuilding, whether it is FRP, steel or aluminum. Because of the strength of shipbuilding in Goa, the necessary ancillary industry also has developed. 
and in fact these two industries are now complementing each other and helping each other perform valve manufacturing ship equipment manufacturing ship designing carrying out complex uh, calculations like cfd analysis manufacturing of electrical panels everything is happening in goa and this has been possible because of the robust ship building practice that is existing in goa the existing cluster strength also has percolated to outfitting items like stone tube bushing propeller shafts stone gear manufacturing rudder manufacturing and life saving appliances moving from goa the other ship building states of india which are contributing to ocean building are andhra pradesh gujarat karnataka kerala maharashtra tamil nadu and west bengal there will be definitely small scale ship building happening in other states also but majorly these are the states that are contributing to ship building the indian ship building market can majorly be classified into three segments that's the domestic market global market and the indian defense market the domestic market is when you are designing and building ships for Uh, indian coast operations within indian territorial waters the global market is when you are manufacturing it for the asia pacific or europe or any other part of uh, the world where you can export the boat or the ship and the third being the indian defense market that is the indian navy for requirements of these fast crafts interceptor boats patrolling vessels auxiliary crafts and certain uh, weapon fitted and weapon based vessels also to ensure that the indian shipyards are rising to the call of nation building through their activity we need to understand that every industry cannot be spoken of in isolation it is dependent on an entire ecosystem for its progress and for it to function successfully in that role the entire ecosystem has to be thriving and existing ship building cannot be treated as uh, any gdp contributor industry or a investment industry it is a strategic industry and that is why it needs to be given that kind of importance because it has the potential to make you a global power and holds your opinion very strongly in policy making at the international level ship building being a very highly capital intensive industry will require a lot of support from the government that is what the other economies and emerging economies also have done and built up on it the growth of indian ship building can be linked to four essential parameters which will eventually empower the msc shipyards to contribute to the growth one is the government policies itself the second being the progress of coastal shipping the strong forward and backward connection of industries that is how well we are going to have a coordinated and seamless flow of effort from the suppliers the vendors the associates to the end users that is the customers the end users of the boats and the political stability for understanding the industry and its needs and having a vision it's very important that we have political stability because ship building industry has a very high gestation period and it is not something that can be set up overnight the government policy initiatives that we propose that are required for indian shipyards to rise as a domestic opportunity are on the lines of auto industry how the indian government has safeguarded them by providing 100% import duty on uh, new new vehicles similarly we should also have 100% import duty on new ships 125% import duty on used ships and ships being a larger investment anything more than 5 years old should be disallowed the capital expenditure and operational expenditure that goes into building a ship up 
operating a ship or owning a ship is very high and that is why it is important that the finance that is available for the industry and for the potential investors is available at 2% interest rate one more issue which is hampering the investment sentiment in the shipping sector is that when you are building a ship the bankers or the financial institutions they do not consider the ship as a collateral or as a primary security so you have to align in a primary security with a property or something land based and then go for a collateral which becomes too much of a financial burden on an investor or an entrepreneur who wants to start his career into shipping hence uh, we are requesting the government that the ship per se should be taken as the primary and the only security that is required to invest in this industry the loan tenure should again be for 15 years and not a short term loan as i said earlier it's a high gestation industry and it will not be possible to turn around or have rois of 2 years and 3 years in this industry the prevailing gst practice uh, is also causing a major hindrance for the kind of regulation being implemented right now the major contributor of cost of project that is steel is still being purchased at 18% while the sale of ship is at 5% so there is a huge amount of money getting blocked cash flow getting blocked and also by certain refund policies the entire refund of gst is not being availed by shipyards this needs to be looked into in detail and uh, sorted out so that the industry can start functioning more seamlessly there is a practice of availing bank guarantees uh, from the ship builder by the ship owner against the payments that they give to safeguard their stage payments which is rightly so however for government projects uh, we believe that the bank guarantee should be limited to 20% of the project cost which will enable the msc shipyards startups and entrepreneurs also to participate and be able to focus and use their money in building projects rather than making financial arrangements we have seen over a period of time that the payments from government institutions are very slow and by certain practices at state level they get delayed which cause major issues for the msc shipyards to exist or go on performing to the subsequent order and it's a request that when a project or a work order is given to a shipyard of the msc category there should be an escrow account open and the money should be paid in advance and you have an arrangement where once the stage is achieved and it is certified by a third party the shipyard should be able to withdraw his money from the escrow account this will ensure that the interest of all safe uh, all stakeholders is safeguarded one big issue that is hampering uh, the employment at the msc sector is that public sector units which are capable of building 50000 tonners and aircraft carriers and highly complex vessels they are also dwelling into building small crafts what happens with that is that the public sector units are having a participation in both the segments and the core competence of small crafts which exist in the msms they tend to get ignored in a lot of projects hence public sector units should be focusing only on large size projects for the very purpose of which they are established and the msc category projects that is up to 100 crore project value should be kept for the msc industries and enterprises to compete among themselves at the coastal shipping level and operational level there are various challenges which make day to day functioning of the industry and trade very difficult one of the major factors is when you go to build a ship Uh, you need to have a registration for the ship so that you can do the subsequent licenses and everything that needs to be done to make the ship immediately into trade once it's ready so there is has to be a system of either issuing a provisional registry or a registry which can be done during the construction period and this should be an online system which within 7 days of application should be processed 
we need to have a single window clearance when you intend to invest or establish uh, a shipyard so that the entrepreneur or the investor or the ship builder doesn't need to lose a lot of important time of setting up the shipyard into availing clearances one of the challenges that lot of small shipyards face and the typical topography of uh, indian coastline is that they are all tidal ports the minor ports are tidal ports the shipyards are situated on banks of river which are affected by uh, tides the low tide and high tide and that is why a lot of small shipyards are unable to cater to the entire process of ship building and operations on a 24/7 basis they have to let go of certain boats which they are very capable of building and repairing but because of the infrastructural limitation at the banks of the river they are unable to undertake that and build up on their existing potential and competency hence if the government can allot a deep draft berth in every minor port or major port where the shipyards of the neighboring area can bring their ships and complete it or attend to repairs that will ensure that the employment in the local area also increases it is also important that the government of india mandates at least a minimum amount of 100 acres of foreshore land in every coastal area to be developed as a marine industrial estate and this industrial estate can bring a lot of investment to the locals can also bring employment to the locals can also help in skill development can also ensure that small hubs and clusters are developed so that the competency of indian ship building goes up from a coastal shipping point of view we are proposing that there has to be a dedicated corridor so that the ships going from one port to other can seamlessly sail from one port to other without losing a lot of time as it is it is a multi modal cargo movement it is going to be handled more number of times as compared to road cargo for end to end connectivity it is important that if this dedicated corridor is given the ships entire transit time can be reduced waiting periods at the ports can be reduced on the financial aspect the government policy initiatives that we propose is that this bank guarantee at a global level is a necessity and suppose a small shipyard based on its competency and ability is able to sign a work order of a higher value the financial institution should be immediately ready to sanction a bank guarantee limit to him based on his order book so that he can take the order and execute it on in a timely manner bank guarantee charges that are being taken by these big banks with the small shipyards also are in the range of 1.5% to 2.5% which again is a huge burden so if you are even doing a project of 50 crore rupees you end up paying almost uh, 75 to 80 lakhs rupees of uh, bank guarantee charges which is a huge amount of money to be competitive we need to understand that government has given this uh, financial assistance scheme which goes from uh, 15 to 20% of the project cost for the indian shipyards and uh, the entire benefit is not reaching to the shipyard or to the uh, competency requirement at that competing level globally because a lot of it is lost in these bank guarantee charges it is a lot of it is lost in the income tax which leaves a very little amount to the shipyard to globally compete globally to compete we also are seeing that there is a trend uh, which lot of other shipyards are offering they are offering ships on a leasing model similar to the aircraft leasing model so a lot of uh, big shipyards are offering ships on lease to ship owners at a fraction of an uh, initial advance which is also causing the indian shipyards to lose out on lot of potential orders which they could have otherwise built at a much lesser price in fact so in fact we could have built let us say a tug of 50 ton bullard pull for an x cost which is much lesser than the international cost with the help of the financial assistance scheme but now we are shipyards are giving it on leasing model so the initial payment that uh, an owner has to pay is very less only about 15% of project cost so even if the project is about 10% more expensive than an indian ship builder what essentially happens is because of the initial investment being less 
the ship owner tends to give the order to the foreign shipyard. Yeah. This is one more uh, financing model that the Indian government will need to step in and uh, sensitize the Indian financial institutions to take cognizance of the global methods and accordingly support the Indian shipyards. Like I said, the financial subsidy availed as on today should uh, be tax free because the subsidy that we avail after the entire processing charges, the taxes, whatever gets left is too little to be globally competitive. When the analysis was done, the analysis was done thinking that there's a 20% of price gap between the global player and the Indian player. Now, after deducting uh, all the costs and overheads that go into availing the subsidy, uh, a little bit of less than 7% is really left to actually do a, take a price advantage. Procurement of steel and every item, if it is a global order, should be at 0% because sale uh, of ship is at 0% GST. So if we are signing any global order, I think all our procurement should be at a tax free basis because when we sell also, we are not collecting any GST. This will help these MSE and the small shipyards uh, from getting their cash flow blocked. Also, whenever we tend to take or compete or participate for any global order, if it is a specialized ship or if it has a different multiple to it, it is important that the small shipyard augments its capacity or facility to meet that order. For such kind of a situation, if I have to import any equipment to improve my productivity, it should be duty free and I should be able to raise that funds on a 15 year loan basis with a interest rate of not more than 2%. This is what is going to help the small shipyards participate more aggressively into global orders. At the industry participation level of making India shipyards, Indian shipyards as a global opportunity. Uh, in my opinion, we need to have at least 10 maritime clusters on uh, totally on both the coast of India because the development of maritime cluster is going to provide a huge impetus to the shipbuilding and maritime community sector and the locals residing around that cluster. A maritime cluster developing has a straight progressive impact on the productivity of the engineering companies and beneficiary companies also in that area. It will help them to standardize the quality that can be rolled out from that state. The safety level of the practices being followed in shipyard also have a huge progress when a maritime cluster is developed because they get exposure to new technology, new practices, skill development happens in these clusters which will percolate and translate into a reality for the local shipyards and the local community and engineering companies. Through the cluster scheme, you can get equipment which are state of the art and modern, which are more safe to operate and more economical to operate and more environmentally sustainable. So development of these clusters will ensure that our carbon footprint also as a global player is brought down. Like I said, small is the next big. I strongly believe that the small shipyards is what we need for the country. A lot of small shipyards together can make a big difference, can give a big advantage to India. MSCs are known to be the bloodline of any economy. And that is why I strongly opine that development of MSC shipyards in India is the only strategy that will spearhead the becoming force of Indian supremacy in global maritime sector. That's the only strategy we can follow, gentlemen. That's the only way forward. That's the only way we can make India a global power in shipbuilding. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. That was an excellent presentation by Mr. Dailani. I would now like to invite Mr. Rishikesh Narsimhan, General Manager, Head of Production, LNT Shipbuilding for his presentation. 
Mr. Rishikesh Narasimhan has a bachelor's degree in marine engineering from DMET Calcutta and an MBA from the Open University Milton Keynes UK. He is a certified first class chief engineer and has sailed on bulk carriers, product and crude oil tankers for eight years. Before his shipbuilding career that spans 16 years, he spent a decade as a surveyor with one of the world's leading classification societies. He joined LNT Shipbuilding in August 2011 in order to start the production unit at the Greenfield Shipyard, and his team has delivered more than 25 significant ships and 15 smaller crafts. Over to you, Mr. Rishikesh Narasimha. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Padma. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm going to, uh, before I uh, say good afternoon to uh, Mr. Hazra, uh, Mr. Uh, Dailani, uh, Mr. Shivraman, and all the honor esteemed guests who are listening to me. I will just take a minute to see if the screen is okay. Can you see the screen? Not yet. And uh, now? No, sir. Oh, but just a second. Uh, okay, share screen. Yes, we can. Is that better? Yes. Okay. I'll just uh, go to slideshow. Okay. So, uh, uh, is everything okay now? Yes, sir. Fine. Thank you. Uh, before I uh, start, uh, I'm going to just make a small introduction and then I get to the meat. And today's topic is uh, about shipyards and shipbuilding. And how to bring and how to combine defense and commercial projects to enhance capacity utilization. Uh, just a one or two introductory slides before I uh, tell you what the contents of my talk is. Now you can see on the uh, slide that I've got, I've tried to list some of the major yards uh, which existed in 2010 and then in 2021. Actually, I made this list only in December, so I think. January 2022 is just looks the same. In blue, you can see the yards that have managed to survive the onslaught of 10 years of China, Chinese aggression, and poor, uh, you know, a, a huge global recession in commercial shipping. And of course, you have a small cluster in green of the Goan yards, Goan shipyard, or most of the yards from Goa have actually done pretty well. Most of the yards that have survived the onslaughts of the Chinese have been building different ships. And uh, of course, now there looks like the commercial shipbuilding activity worldwide is going to improve. Now, <clears throat> since almost 2007 or 2005, the government of India has been systematically focusing on maritime to make sure that uh, we are also abreast with the ambitious growth targets of India as a uh, entity in the world. Now, it has not been so successful, but some area successes have come, especially in the Indian Naval Indigenization Plan. You can see that the import content of, in, of uh, naval ships have come down dramatically when it comes to the simple uh, import contents, which is to do what we call the float activity. In the move, that is the propulsion and generation activities, uh, about 60% is indigenous. But of course, in the weapons system, we are still importing a lot. So there has been some uh, uh, you know, positive movement there. But as you know, we are talking about commercial shipbuilding and the commercial maritime cluster. India still has a long way to go. We can see that we are in uh, number 18 in the world and it has dropped down our, globe, our tonnage and many other areas in the maritime cluster. I'm not getting into the details, but the fact that is there that the government is trying its level best. And when you want to do something which is uh, in this direction, you always look at how the Japanese did it, how the Koreans did it, how the Chinese did it. And uh, you know, I, uh, I, what I did was I called one of my friends from, uh, uh, from Korea and I asked him, Okay, Indians know how the Koreans did it, but can the Koreans tell me how the Koreans did it? And he sent me something in Korean, which I use Google Translate and I put it here. So uh, 
you know, it may not be exactly good English, but let me explain to you what the Koreans think they did. The Koreans got into shipbuilding in a big way using five basic activities. Number one, government guarantees. I don't need to get into the details. Everybody knows the various ways the government can help. Then, hand over shipyards to revolutionary companies. I've actually transliterated from the Korean words. What they said is, they handed over the shipyards to Hyundai, Samsung, and Daewoo, which they call were revolutionary companies who can bring about a dramatic change from the traditional shipbuilding way the Koreans were building. Creating a strong competition to export, then universities for shipbuilding, and finally developing strong in-house production technology. Now you can see the government of India has done pretty much the same, except for one area. It gave government guarantees, handed over shipyards and made shipyards uh, come up. It wanted to create some strong competition. They allowed, you know, many, uh, at least uh, different ships could be uh, built even by private uh, companies through uh, tendering processes, etc. And of course, uh, universities like the IMU was there to build and encourage technical training. But there was one thing Indian shipyards did not do, and that was in-house. That is developing strong in-house production technology. We, so, so my presentation today is, is the search for productivity possible in defense shipyards? How can efficient assembly lines be a strategic competency for India? And we examine what kind of a model will work for Indian yards to compete with the Southeast Asian yards. We need not always copy the Chinese and the Japanese. Let's have our own style. You can also see that uh, in the uh, Indian, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, maritime report, the government of India has released very recently, they have actually identified productivity needs to improve. And in all these areas, number one is everybody has talked about the material costs in India, which is about higher than the rest of the world. The fact that owners have to pay a higher finance cost than the rest of the world. 13% material cost, 26% um, what do you call uh, finance costs, but the labor cost is relatively 52% higher than even countries like Korea and Japan, which have a very high labor cost. And this is one area where I try to see if the government has any remedy and they don't have, because the remedy for this lies with the yards themselves. And let's see how the Koreans did it. But before I come to that, I'm going to talk about one report here. I just checked out, you know, this uh, is just an additional slide. I tried to see whether the data that the government has got was pretty much uh, what the global uh, benchmark is. And I found out that they were. And uh, I had a look at some of these yards here. In fact, SSP shipyard has got one. I had visited that yard in 2010. But I asked one of my Korean friends how the SSP shipyard is doing and they said it's gone bankrupt. So just being a very high productivity shipyard does not mean that in the shipping world, you can't go back, you can still go back. But we'll talk about that later on. Okay, now let's get back to a little bit of storytelling. In 2005, the British yards, the British government asked a company called Rank Corporation to find out if British yards, which were solely dependent on government orders, which com could compete with commercial orders if the time came where the Ministry of Defense had no orders to give to the British yards. And let's see what happened. They found out that Europe had largely concentrated on naval orders to create sustainability. And of course, they have a lot of advantages. Naval ships offer a much higher profit. Military contracts have more engineering and are more complex. It also allows higher value engineering. It allows large infrastructure developments in yards and finally less competition from overseas yards. So naturally, when yards require to sustain, they fall back and take large number of naval orders. And that's what we also did. But Warships are, high, are hardly exported. You can see the black is the domestic use and blue is the export amount. Except for Russia and Spain, hardly any 
um, uh, countries really export it to other countries. France, of course, does it, but United Kingdom, Japan, Germany, in fact, Korea and China hardly export their ships to other countries. But naval yards, which are dedicated, have a few disadvantages. They have lean periods and long lead time between contracts. And to even out the workload, some commercial fillers may be required. Sometimes they take it, sometimes they do. But the most important part is the motivation to retain that competitive edge, that production speed ebbs with time. And that becomes a problem. And that is not just for us. It's globally for the British because this report is for the British yards. So with the change, sorry, uh, so, just a second. Sorry, sir. Actually, uh, the screen is a little cluttered. So, I had to. So, now the situation is like this that there seems to be a lot of new laws which are coming, and a new shipping boom could come out. But shipyards are opportunists. Can Indian yards, which are building and, uh, you know, to tell you frankly, we are full with orders. We have got a lot of orders. Can we sit through the boom time in commercial shipbuilding without dipping our hand into this pot of gold? It's like investing in bond and keeping quiet when the stock market is going through the roof. Obviously, we can't do it. But how should we enter? So, question number one is, are naval ships, building of naval ships different from commercial ships? Well, in a poll, they found out it was 50-50. In fact, no, I would say it's more or less the same. Yes, there are some more stringent uh, requirements. And of course, there are some redundancies in uh, different ships. But, uh, you know, technically, they remain the same. The second part is naval ships actually consume a lot of man hours. Consume commercial ships, on the other hand, consume a lot of manpower. Now, what I'm trying to say is that naval ships take a long time. But if you take a naval ship, the labor expended are tremendously higher than the, uh, the labor expended on commercial ships. But the amount of manpower that you need has to be concentrated over a small period of time for commercial ships so that you can keep the schedules. <clears throat> so it brings me to the next point. Obviously, uh, let me just go back to hit one major uh, point here in my slide. If you see that in commercial ships, the hull component has a very high labor and it's very important for the rest of the activities to follow. So it is very important that in your assembly line for shipbuilding, even though in India, they always say that anybody can build a, build a hull, it's very difficult to build, uh, to get the engineering in place. Unless the hull is in place, the engineering does not come up. So efficient assembly lines is a strategic competency for Indian yards and is a big necessity. Now it comes to the second point. I'm sitting in Chennai and uh, just a trivia. I understand that uh, uh, the uh, GDP of Tamil Nadu is almost equal to the GDP of Pakistan. So I can say that there's a lot of industrial work that goes on here, especially in the automobile sector. And people always ask me, uh, Rishi, why, what is so difficult in putting an assembly line uh, in, a, in a shipyard? We are doing it all the time uh, in, uh, uh, in automobile industries. Well, the real reason why you can't do it so easily, you cannot put an assembly line so easily in a shipyard is because actually assembly lines require a change in a process at a particular stage. For example, when a car is being built, you have a station you can change something, either you change some uh, measuring equipment or you change some robotic equipment or you retrain the technician, give him a new skill and you can make an improvement in the assembly line. But shipbuilding lies in between processes and projects. And any change in process requires multiple stakeholders to agree. And therefore, a new way of doing work requires a huge cultural change. And that is why it becomes so much more difficult in shipbuilding to make changes in its process. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Now, uh, 
there is a word that the Korean used, and I wanted to use the Korean words. In India, we call it production engineering, but I try to use the word production technology because production engineering is an academic activity, but production technology is more of the method by which the Japanese or the Korean workers, they keep improving little by little. For example, if you need a block to be made faster, you have to define the welding sequence, identify the locking points, try to minimize distortion due to heat, keep weld size as low as possible so that the heat input is reduced. A single block, for example, will have about 100, 200 parts. And each sub-assembly will have to be sequenced so that the 20 or 30 people that you have are not idling on a daily basis. And that requires a certain amount of, uh, what should I say, intelligence of the foreman, what they call technicians. So optimizing a block, and a ship has got about 50 blocks, you got to have a design engineer who sees that the cutting allowances are such that post welding, when the shrinkage takes place, you don't have a plate that has shrunk more than required. Just to give you an example, if you've got 10 stiffeners, every time you make a weld on a stiffener, you'll find that the plate has shrunk by say 0.2 or 0.3 mm. Finally, if you have 10 to 15 stiffeners, you'll have that whole plate has shrunk by 20 mm, or, I mean about 10, uh, 10 mm, which means that that much extra work you have to do by again cutting and doing the work. So cutting allowances is something that has to be understood by the design team and the foreman and in introduced. The block division sequence has to be done by production engineering, bending accuracy by design template. I'm not getting into details because it's a wider audience and not just uh, shipbuilders. But if anybody has a doubt, you can just flag. Then the sub-assembly sequence, block assembly sequence has to be done by production, training the welders for the welding procedure sequences by welding department, you can see that the validation for a prototype of a ship, which has around 50 blocks, and almost no, no two blocks in a ship is the same because it is not a mirror image. I mean, there is a mirror image, but it is not an assembly line activity. It takes about six to seven months to put in place. Now, when you have something like this done, and just two ships of the naval type, you do have a problem that when variations of the hull type is so high, you can never implement and have an efficient shipyard for a certain prototype all the time. But nevertheless, over a period of time, when you have got all this data gathered, you can, of course, uh, cater to it, but it does take some decision time. You can see that we have, this is all uh, actual pictures that I've taken from the foreman's notebook. We also have to have production technology in piping where the spools are all added together. And when you see these beautiful photographs of how advanced outfitting is done in Japanese yards, this was one of the blocks that we advanced outfitted. It took us almost three to four ships before we could come to this point. And this is a OPV series where we, that we were doing, seven of a series. It's very rare that you get seven ships in naval yards. So you have, if you need to put production efficiency into place, naturally we'll have to take commercial ships because they come in large quantities. So my question is, why does productivity elude Indian yards? The reason is simple. Well, let me tell that Indians are not unique in this. The Chinese had to struggle. The Brazilians could never learn from the Japanese. The, in fact, I had talked to IHI uh, uh, team that went to Brazil when uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Lula was in power and then the next person who Brazil wanted to go into offshore in a big way and the entire Japanese team went there. But finally, after two to three years, they found out that the Brazilians could not learn from the Japanese. The Koreans went to Iran to build ships in the Caspian Sea. Finally, they had to send the complete Korean workforce. And you know, to my Iranian friends, I always joke that the Indians can't do it because we are intelligent. And the Iranians cannot do it because you are more intelligent than us. Well, it's just a joke. Don't take it too hard. So productivity in shipbuilding is actually a function of intelligent labor and intelligent assembly line. So it's not just ca capital infuse or some cranes to be put in place. It is a change which is cultural. You have to learn how to work with others and how to work with competency. So the point what I'm trying to drive at is 
efficient shipyards certainly will have to put processes in place but the tacit knowledge which we call competency cannot always be defined and this has to be taught and has to be captured by maybe august institutions uh, under the umbrella of the imu so you can see that just yesterday we completed this bulbous bow this bulbous bow is uh, quite a tough work so uh, you know it's kept in the skeleton condition because after painting there will be slot welding on this because you can't go inside and do it so it's almost a finished condition and the people who do this if you ask them to write a process they will not be able to write so we need to have some kind of a method by which tacit knowledge is captured and at the same time the process is also captured so let's understand what kind of a model can indian will work for indian yards now hybrid yards where the uh, shipyards take some different ships and some commercial ships have also been tried and i'll try to give you some example military ships have customized design but commercial ships have volume business complex but stable military ships commercial ships are simple but the contracts are very rigid and you have to have very rigid delivery schedules flexibility is not allowed so there is a risk here and of course uh, the high steel volume in small uh, uh, you know the uh, different ships have high steel volume sorry hull steel volume is small engineering is complex but very high but in commercial ships the hull uh, is a large amount of uh, hull volume is there engineering is simple but the price is very low so it does give you a certain amount hybrid ships uh, shipyards are uh, have been tried out in the past and it does give certain amount of you know complementary uh, uh, flexibility to uh, shipyards and they have been tried uh, so this is little bit of the same uh, now some of the yards that have tried uh, to combine commercial with military ships in the same yards are kawasaki ihi mitsubishi they take commercial ships of the same size that means that whatever size is the naval ships they take they take same sizes of commercial ships the koreans have tried it like ih hhi and samsung have both got it but they are pretty much they keep these two divisions separate because the uh, uh, korean ships are pretty small and the entire division is separate it's operated by another uh, sister company but it's all always in the same complex europeans have of course tried it all their time but europeans are different their work approach is different because their competency competency level is high and they are so flexible that they can build any ship the problem is their cost are very high so the two major issues that elude indian yards are sustainable profits and international productivity when the market is good you have to enter but to enter you have to sharpen your sword by keeping your productivity high so indian yards especially those to conclude now the indian yards especially those that have survived the last decade of recession are now full with naval orders it's a fact but this is the right right time to focus on productivity because often we are asking for subsidy at some point of time government will also tell us that if you keep subsidizing without improving your efficiency then the government is subsidizing inefficiency and they are not going to like it now productivity requires repeat ships and therefore it may be a good idea to take some commercial ships in a step by step way productivity is a core strategy to be exploited at boom times and maybe now is the time for uh, us to start focusing and putting all our effort in productivity because subsidies and uh, you know other financial uh, tools can be given as a policy but creating a culture where ship building has to be made very quickly that takes time effort and a certain amount of uh, intellectual capital to put that in place thank you very much and i hope uh, uh, i can answer any questions if i have to yes sir yes. Thank you very much uh, for an excellent presentation and an earnest plea for efficient assembly lines for a strategic competency in indian ship building uh, we have uh, a few questions 
Yeah, one of the questions is uh, for uh, Mr. Rishikesh. The sixth attribute that the Koreans had uh, was uh, in-house design capabilities of the software technology sort driven <coughs> of user demand and not regulatory guidance. Where are we on that in India, please? Uh, sorry, can you please repeat the question? The sixth attribute that the Koreans had and yes. had was in in-house design capabilities of the software technology sort driven often by user demand and not regulatory guidelines. Yes, yes. See, uh, yeah, uh, just uh, please allow me to explain. Uh, the design that is made by a shipyard, there are two types. One is called uh, the basic drawing, basic design, and the second is production drawings. The basic design are uh, the drawings which are pretty much universal and good uh, designers can make it. Their production drawing is actually the language that is used by the worker. For example, let me put it in a crude way. If I talk Tamil, then the, and the worker speaks Tamil, then Tamil is the production drawing. So the language of how the worker assembles in that yard is what the production drawing is. Uh, at least Larson and Tubro has got its own production drawing and most yards must have it. Otherwise, if they keep having new production drawings, they will spend a lot of, trying, lot of time trying to understand what he means when he gives certain symbols, when he makes you do it in a certain way. And uh, I can give you two examples where we had in one of the ships uh, that I built in uh, a Hindustan shipyard, the entire production drawing was done by a Chinese company. And uh, it took us almost one or two shifts before we understand, well, before we understood what they were talking about. On the other hand, the basic drawings, design drawing, which is there, which is usually given to experienced uh, 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 designers, they are more or less the same because they go to classification societies, they put their uh, stamp, etc. More or less, it is standardized. So, to answer your question. At least I know that Larson and Tubro has got its own in-house design capabilities of both production drawing and uh, this uh, uh, basic design. I know that Cochin Shipyard is very good about uh, in it. I know that GRSC is very good about it. At least these three yards I know are quite good. Hindustan Shipyard is also pretty good. So to answer, uh, yes, we have got both expertise with us. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's one more question on... Um... Uh, for Mr. Shivraman, maybe, uh, Shivram, how to approach or convince global shipyards on the way as uh, CSL has done in, for the deal with Norway for building autonomous vessels? Is there a transfer of technology in this case? Yeah, I will answer the second part. Yes, there is a transfer of technology here. The for This autonomous vessel, what we are talking, the technology is from Kornsberg Maritime. And uh, Coming to the uh, showcasing Indian shipyards to the world market, I think uh, India did pretty well in this matter in the early 2000s when we were in the offshore industry, Bharati shipyard, ABG shipyard. They all uh, could uh, demonstrate and uh, Europeans, Americans, uh, uh, Arabs, all of, from all parts of the world besides uh, and uh, LNT has also got a lot of orders from Gulf. Cochin has uh, exported more than 45 vessels to various uh, Western European countries. So we had demonstrated it in the past. And uh, unfortunately, cancellation of the orders and uh, the difficult period when uh, we could not uh, revive it. And uh, then uh, the brand India's image in the merchant fleet has come down. But uh, I think if we act together, uh, definitely we can uh, come back. I believe uh, in this uh, aspect, more uh, collaborative and uh, collective approach by all the shipyards can uh, re definitely bring uh, that confidence which the world market needs, that at least the operators and owners all around the world needs. And uh, I believe uh, our uh, past performance in the 2000, early 2000s with the offshore industry only has brought this uh, order also. 
so the past good work is uh, only has only brought this order as well i think uh, we can do it and chowgle is consistently doing it they are exporting a lot of uh, short sea shipping vessels to european market to the best in class uh, dutch and uh, german clusters so i don't think uh, it's difficult as uh, my colleague uh, mr narasimhan has been telling we have to demonstrate the competency with respect to timely delivery efficiency and productivity i believe uh, if that we can demonstrate i will, i think uh, india can come back okay thank you the last question uh, i think she, there is this question by mr thomas clinton i think shipyards and maritime industry in india should adopt an employee centric approach uh, with my travel experience to various countries i feel indian shipyards have a minimalistic approach towards workforce welfare and development plan i think the industry should work on this and address these issues along with the development plans either of you uh, yeah i can uh, actually uh, uh, may i know the gentleman who spoke this mr thomas clinton is he from india or from abroad uh well okay let me you see uh, mr clinton uh, in the 1980 uh, i went to norway and uh, they told me that uh, you know the people are our greatest asset i was shocked because in india we were always told that if you go away i'll get 10 more chances so uh, it has from 1980 to 2022 believe me at least the senior people have understood that the human resource is very important in fact i must say that uh, the latest uh, report had come that the um, population in tamil nadu was dropping below the replacement value but 5 years ago i used to tell everybody that i am not finding people here and now we are realizing we can't uh, we uh, the human being are really an asset so to answer your question we have already realized it but we are a land of some inertia but slowly it is we have understood the the uh, the importance of developing a human resource thank you mr rishkesh uh, over to mr hazra good afternoon i think we had a wonderful session with mr shivaram mr dalani and mr narsimhan all of them making excellent presentation and i am also happy that uh, you know various if i may say so various sectors of uh, ship building was represented in this session because of course we have today the country's largest shipyard kochi shipyard being represented we have lnt which is a mid mid size shipyard and then we had this konkan maritime presentation which basically you know caters to the small small sh uh, ships uh, need so uh, i must also mention that as as mr shivram said that early 2000 india was really doing very well in ship building and we were always talking about you know from less than 1% reaching 5% uh in in a matter of just a few years and things like that but unfortunately uh going forward we have actually declined quite sharply as far as ship building is concerned ship building is an extremely important industry because it is not only capital intensive but it's also labor intensive and particularly if you look at uh, ship building and ship repair together with the ancillary industries then it gives a tremendous fillip to the country's economy and india has it all if i may say so i think in terms of engineering competence after all steel building also we have become now the world's number 2 uh, well ahead of japan only of course uh, we are <laughs> we are one tenth of china still but nevertheless we are well ahead of any other country in the world other than china and uh, we have the competence in terms of engineering we have i mean as i said we have everything because after all as far as uh, shipping is concerned though unfortunately shipping tonnage wise india as it has been shown in today's presentation only india ranks about 18th but nevertheless in terms of shipping competence because after all indian seafarers are considered second to none in the world 
and while india has just about 1% of the sh ship uh, shipping tonnage if you uh, i mean particularly look at the you know overseas shipping market india uh, indian fleet in terms of international fleet is just about 1% but india supplies 10% or so of the seafarers and uh, in terms of ship uh, management again the indians have pride of place in most of the big uh, ship management companies across the globe so in that sense professional competence wise india has everything ship building and as as we say that you know hyundai shipyard which is today considered to be the world's largest shipyard hyundai shipyard and cochin shipyard they were actually you know uh, founded almost together and at one time i think cochin shipyard i am talking of of course uh, decades back cochin shipyard was slightly ahead of hyundai shipyard in terms of tonnage etc but then where is hyundai shipyard today and cochin shipyard of course in the recent past cochin shipyard has been doing well and we have so much of pride with the aircraft carrier being built in uh, you know cochin shipyard india is only i think third or fourth country in the world which is building its own aircraft carrier so we have the competence and after all one as one says ship building is no rocket science if uh, india can you know send uh, you know india can have a martial uh, project why can't india build ships but i think in terms of pure you know bulk carrier tanker the big uh, you know uh, big commercial vessels it will be very difficult for india to compete because since the indian economy is growing this this problem is there even slightly coming up in china the labor cost is going and unfortunately in india the productivity being low the labor you know so called labor cost may be uh, you know may appear to be cheap but then actually we end up paying much more because of the low productivity so that's why i am saying just in pure uh, average uh, you know ship type it will be difficult for india to catch up but at least where it comes to be you know more uh, engineering oriented i think india can do definitely well and uh, even as as it has been mentioned by uh, mr shivram only uh, cochin shipyard is doing one of the first you know fully autonomous ship in the offshore sector for for an norwegian entity so india has all that competence and i think if all the fiscal policies and as as we have seen in the presentation so many other requirements are met then i am quite sure india can do much much better than what it is doing today so i think uh, everyone has projected a i would say a uh, you know huge potential and uh, a bright future ahead in case the potential can really be exploited and we can really live up to it so with that i think we are running quite uh, behind our schedule about 15 minutes behind schedule so i would uh, again once again hand over to padma to take over from the organizers thank you very much mr hazra for an excellent uh, summation of the session